the Protestant Reformation started about 500 years ago with Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. The reason it started is because the gospel for hundreds of years was all but lost. They had built up the Roman Catholic Church at this time, many things around the gospel, and the gospel was almost there. You could almost see it, but it was almost like a building that's under construction, and you put scaffolding up and around it. I heard one, one author say, he said, you can look at a building, but if there's scaffolding up everywhere, it's just kind of obstructing the view of what's really going on because they're trying to improve it, they're trying to work on it, and for hundreds of years, that is basically the case in the church at large in the world. The Roman Catholic Church had put all of this scaffolding up so you couldn't really see the gospel. That was the main, the main issue that was going on in the days of guys like Martin Luther and John Calvin and other reformers that worked for the Reformation. And it changed the world. We can't actually probably fathom what life would be like today if the Protestant Reformation didn't happen in the 1500s. It changed the world. It changed Christianity. It actually didn't bring something new. It was just a recovery of what the Bible actually says. And so rather than looking to the traditions of men and what popes and creeds and councils say as authoritative, the reformers kept just championing that we need to look to the Scripture alone because, as we even looked at before, Scripture alone is breathed out by God. Men today, popes, councils, it doesn't matter how many agree, popular opinion, it doesn't matter. That's not, as Paul says, theonoustos, meaning it, it doesn't proceed from the mouth of God, but Scripture does. And as the reformers returned to Scripture the gospel was rediscovered. And the, really, the focal point of the gospel, just in general, as communicated in the Bible, is we are made right with God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. That's a great summary of what the gospel is. We're saved by grace, nothing that we do. It's through faith in Jesus. By grace, through faith, in Christ. And so the second real pillar of this Protestant Reformation that God used to bring the gospel back to the church and to change the world as we know it was in the Latin, sola gratia. It's an important phrase for you to learn because this is your history. This is your Christian heritage. This is how God used these men to point us back to the scripture and see that it's by grace and by grace alone that we are made right with God. Sola gratia means grace alone. Everything came from sola scriptura, returning to the scripture, and one of the first things the reformers saw was it's all of grace. So what they most needed in the 16th century was to return to the truth of the scriptures so that they would see the gospel. And frankly, what many local churches and the church at large needs most today in the 21st century is the same exact thing. Churches, pastors, Christians need to return to sola scriptura. We need to rediscover what the reformers rediscovered in the 16th century because it's just frankly not happening in a lot of churches. We aren't exempt from that either. We can think, well, we preach the Bible every week, but are you looking to the Scripture alone for why you should do what you should do, why you should believe the way that you believe about yourself, about God, about why you exist, about how we are saved, about how God gives us grace? Do you look to the Scripture alone for that? What we really need in our day is the same thing that they did. We need to return to the Scriptures, and we need to look to the Scriptures alone to tell us the good news of the Gospel. Because frankly, the Gospel is better news than you're ever going to think about on your own. The Gospel is better news than we can ever really truly communicate, but God has communicated enough for us to get it. Today, the Gospel has been radically watered down if not all but lost in many local churches, 
we need to recover these five solas. The Scripture alone communicates the truth of God and how we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. So what do we see about the gospel when we turn to the Scriptures? That's what we look at today. If you've got your Bible, make sure you've got it open to the passage that was just read to you. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. This is the longest sentence in the entire Bible. If you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you know that sometimes he can be confusing and it's like he's writing these letters and then things just keep popping into his head and he just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. Well, that is definitely the case here in Ephesians 1. And verses 3 through 14 compile 202 words in the original language. It's like 240 something in English once we translate it. But 202 words, one sentence just keeps being comma, after comma, after comma. Now, in the English, there are periods because the translators try to help us fragment his thoughts a little bit and to look at them. But this is really just one. Paul is just blasting the church at Ephesus, reminding them of the grace of God that they have received. So, as we look to the Scripture, as we look to, really the whole theme of this is grace First off, we see that we are made right with God by grace alone. There are basically two different two-word explanations of what grace means. It's the Greek word charis. It's a huge word all throughout the scriptures. Grace, grace, grace. We're saved by grace alone. So what does grace mean? You might notice I like to step back a little bit when we talk about the scripture and when we're looking at words like that so that we don't just all put our own definition into the word grace and think, well, this is what grace means. Because if you do that and you don't understand what Paul is saying, why he's using that word grace, if you do that, you won't understand his whole argument and what he's actually teaching you if you have your own definition of grace. So we need to see what the Bible says grace is. So there's two different two-word explanations that help us get to the heart of what God means when he says grace, what Paul means when he writes it. And the first is unmerited favor. That's what grace is. It's unmerited favor. Favor given to you that you did not merit, you did not earn. You get that? Unmerited favor. So It means there's no prerequisite. There's no precondition to receiving what you're receiving. There's no earning it. It has nothing to do with the deservedness of the one getting it, but it has everything to do with the one that is giving it. Not the one getting. They didn't have anything to do with it, but the one giving had everything to do. So it is unmerited favor. That's why Paul says in Romans 11, 6, this is, a verse that we need to memorize, especially when it comes to understanding grace. Romans 11, 6, Paul says, If salvation is by grace, then it is no longer on the basis of works. You see, it is no longer on the basis of you working to earn it. If salvation is by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. And then he follows that up with, Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Paul's whole point of saying grace, he says, We need to remember... Grace and works are antithetical. Grace, us receiving grace, we don't earn it. It's unmerited favor. Otherwise, if it wasn't apart from works, then grace would no longer be grace. So that's the first definition, unmerited favor. And the second is ill-deserved blessing. Maybe that's three words and you've got to hyphenate it. I'll just put ill-deserved into one. When you say grace, what is it? Unmerited favor, but also ill-deserved blessing blessing, not undeserved blessing. When the Bible speaks of grace to us, it's not just you receiving something that you did not deserve. It's you and I receiving something good that we deserved the exact opposite of. So it would not have been grace had the police officer that pulled me over a few weeks ago in Oklahoma City when I was going 16 miles over the speed limit It would not have been grace if he just didn't give me a ticket. That would have been mercy. Grace would have been if after I'm not paying attention, I'm going 16 miles over the speed limit, he pulls me over, doesn't give me a ticket, and then takes me out for a steak dinner and pays the bill. 
that would have been more precisely what grace is. Not only did I not get the bad that I did deserve, and I did get a ticket, and I got to pay it. Not only did I get mercy, but grace is more than mercy. Mercy is, I'm not going to give you the bad you deserve. But grace is, you don't get the bad, plus you get the good. Grace is just basically antithetical to way, the way the world works in general. Sometimes people show mercy. A lot of times it's just justice. Sometimes mercy. But grace is when you not only withhold the bad they deserve, but then in spite of that, you give them the good. Parents, you know somewhat of this because you have, probably have to do it a lot. You have to give your kids grace. Not only do you not deserve this food, I'm going to give you good food. Grace is unmerited favor. It's ill-deserved blessing. We don't deserve it at all. We deserve the opposite, but we get the good. And this ill-deserved blessing, this is the language Paul uses in Ephesians 1. It seems for the Apostle Paul, the best way for us to understand the grace of God that we receive in salvation, how we are saved, is by him talking about all of the spiritual blessings that God gives us in Christ. Look at verse 3 in Ephesians 1. At verse 3, and then we're going to go the second half of 7 to see <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> his sandwich in here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has <clears throat> blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So he's saying, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what blessed be. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. He's talking to Christians with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You see that? And then go, so after that, he starts unpacking what these spiritual blessings are. And then at the second half of verse 7, look at that. He, and he gets to the heart of it. He says, this is all, verse 7, be according to the riches of his grace. He gives us spiritual blessings and then he details what they are. And then he says, these are all according to the riches of his grace. Verse 8, which he lavished upon us. It's not just he sort of gives us grace. Paul is saying, he's drowning you, Christian, in grace. You are drowning in unmerited favor, in ill-deserved blessing, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in Him, that's Jesus, things in heaven and things on earth. So the first thing you need to notice is that we're made right with God by grace alone. And this grace, Paul says, are all these spiritual blessings that God gives us. So we're saved by grace, but by grace alone. There's a difference in believing and saying as anybody who professes to be a Christian at all would say, yes, we are saved by grace. But that is not what Paul says. It's not that you and I are saved by grace. The Reformers got it right when they said that's not enough to clearly communicate what the Bible says. We're not just saved by grace. We're saved by grace alone. Not grace and, not grace but, grace alone. Now, why did the Reformers blast that at the mountaintops? Because in the 16th century, here's a little bit of a history lesson, and this is, I think, fascinating to understand. In the 16th century, the view of Rome, of the Roman Catholic Church, was that we are sinners, and we can't really save ourselves, but we have a quantitative problem with our sins, meaning we have a number of sins that we've committed. Okay? And therefore, we need a number of graces to outweigh the number of sins or to deal with those number of sins. So it was more about sins in the plural and graces we would receive in the plural. And so Rome believed and still believes today 
that there were certain people, all they would say through the cross of Jesus, all due to what Jesus has done on the cross, but there are certain basically super Christians who they would later name saints who had more than enough graces to be saved and go to heaven when they die. And so their works of what they called super irrigation, more good works than they needed, would then filter off into something called a treasury of merit. It's essentially a treasure chest that's in heaven. And so people like the Virgin Mary, she's at the front of the line of giving her extra good works that she didn't need all of them to be saved. She had some left over that she got to give to this treasury of merit, which would fill up and fill up as the saints, as these super Christians had more good works than they needed. Their extras went into this treasure chest. And then you and I, normal people who aren't saints, we could be saved by getting these graces through Mary, through Jesus, but ultimately the Pope held the keys to this treasure chest and only through the church could these graces be distributed to people so that you and I could have enough graces to outweigh our sins. And how would you get these graces? How would you get grace from God? You'd be baptized. You would partake in the Mass. You would confess your sins. You could buy indulgences. You'd pray to the saints. You'd pray to Mary. You'd pray to Jesus. And you would get these graces for yourself. So do you see why Rome would not say with us, still to this day, Rome wouldn't say, we are saved by grace alone. It would say, well, we're saved by grace, and it's all due to God's grace and His unmerited favor as we do good works of grace to appropriate those graces to our account. This is what Rome taught, believed, and this is what the Reformers started seeing when they started looking back to the Scripture. When Erasmus produced this Greek manuscript in the New Testament, in the original languages, the Reformers, these guys who were later called Reformers, just normal guys, Roman Catholics at the time, they started reading the Scripture and saying, Whoa, that is not in there. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And you see why this fire was lit in Europe and it changed the whole wor world because they returned to the Word and saw, no, 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 we don't have a quantitative problem like we have too many sins and we need to get these graces. We have a sin problem, period. We are sinners, under the judgment and wrath of God, and we need to be delivered by grace, not by getting a bunch of graces, but by receiving grace from God through Jesus. There's a difference in believing we're saved by grace, we're saved by grace alone. What do you believe? When we talk about 16th century Roman Catholicism, it probably just seems preposterous, right? There's this treasure chest of super irrigation works, all the overflow of the saints' works, and we can get some of those, and it seems ridiculous. We have to get, pull these graces out of heaven, essentially, and it only comes through the church. It probably only seems preposterous to us because we are so conditioned and we've heard the same message time and time again that a lot of us just think, well, that's the gospel. Because around here, especially in the Bible Belt, pretty much the same thing is taught, is preached. Maybe not. You can buy indulgences or there's this treasure chest, but the real question is, how do we receive grace from God? How do we get it? What's the answer? Pray this prayer and ask Jesus into your heart. And then in some traditions, it's, well, yeah, we need to trust Jesus, but baptism, water baptism, is really what seals the deal. That is how you're really cleansed. That's how you really receive grace. And then in some traditions, it would be you need to have enough faith to have the fullness of God, to have God's grace really lavish you. We think it's preposterous talking about 16th century Rome, but we can easily fall prey to the same exact things. This is how you pull grace out of heaven. So the real question, when we look at this whole thing, we've just seen 
Paul's talking about grace, right? Now we're going to get specific as he gets specific. The question we need to ask is not, are we saved by grace or not? Well, yes, everyone says that. That's within the whole realm of calling themselves anywhere close to a Christian. We're saved by grace. But the question is, how do we receive that grace? How do we get it? Now turn with me and look at the second half of verse 3, actually the beginning of verse 4, and Paul blasts us with things that if you haven't faced these before, I promise you they will be difficult because they are totally opposite from the way we think naturally. Look what he says. First, how do we receive the grace of God? We receive grace by being chosen before the foundation of the world. Look at verse 4, the beginning. Even He's just finished saying, He's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as He chose us in Jesus, in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. So when Paul starts talking about grace and how we have received it, do you notice that he's saying we're passive in receiving it? Usually when we hear the word received, if you're anything like me, when I say, how can we receive the grace of God or how do we receive the grace of God, I would guess that most of your minds go straight to, okay, however small it is, how do I need to align to catch it? Sort of, right? It's receiving. We think of our action in receiving like somebody throwing a pass and we receive it. But when the scripture talks about receiving grace from God, especially right here, Paul's saying you are completely passive in your reception of it. As passive as you would be if I went to your bank and deposited a million dollars in your account. You didn't catch it. I just did it. You received it. Wouldn't you say I received a blessing? Yeah, but you didn't catch it. You didn't do anything. It was just there. What Paul is saying here is not he chose us in Jesus before the foundation of the world because he looked through time and saw that we would one day choose Jesus. So before the foundation of the world, he chose us and he saw that we would choose him. Do you see that that is not what Paul's saying? That that logic makes absolutely no biblical sense. Paul is saying God chose us, but what he really means is that God chose us because he later saw that we would choose him, and that's why he chose us. Why does he say it then? He says it because Paul is saying, you want the big picture of why you are in Christ? You are in Christ. You, in time, put your faith in Jesus because before the world existed, the Father said, you're mine. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Paul's saying, so that he would make us, that we would be, not that we, he chose us. And he's like, man, I hope you're going to be good enough. The idea is that he chose us so that he could present us for him, before himself holy and blameless in Christ. This idea, see, theologians call this the difference between conditional election, conditional choosing, or unconditional election, conditional choosing. So the difference would be that some people look at verses like this and say, well, yes, this is God electing us choosing us. The older translations say, and he elected us before the foundation of the world. That's probably closer to the Greek. The Greek is eklegomai, which means elected, chosen. It's just translated chose in our version. It means he chose us before the foundation of the world. So one school of thought is that God chose us because he foresaw that we would later choose Jesus of our own totally neutral free will. We would choose Jesus, and so before the foundation of the world, God chose us. Or God chose to save us through Jesus, everyone who would choose Him. That's one school of thought. That's conditional election. He elected you based upon the condition that you would choose Him of your own neutral free will. Unconditional election 
is that before the foundation of the world, despite you, God chose that he would save you. He didn't just see that you would choose him and then choose you. He chose that he would save you before the foundation. Through and through, friends, that's what the scriptures teach. Not that it was based upon a condition that you would later meet, but it was based upon the condition of God saying, I want you, I'm going to save you, you're mine. Isn't that exactly what Jesus says in John 6? John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And all who come to me, I will never cast out. Doesn't that sound a lot like, wait, what? Well, we know at the, the base level we're saved through faith in Jesus, right? Not works, but through trusting, putting, putting our confidence in Jesus and what he's done for us. But Jesus says, the reason you do that is because the Father gave you as a gift to me. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And all come to me will never be cast out. I will raise him up on the last day. He later says in John 10, My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. He looks at these religious guys who are rejecting him. He says, You don't follow me because you're not one of my sheep. The only time Jesus is hard is with people who say, We don't need you. We can save ourselves. And Jesus says, No, the reason you don't is because you're not one of my flock. All that the Father has given me will come to me, and everyone who comes to me, I'll never cast out. I will raise them up on the last day. And what is the end game of Him choosing us, of us receiving this grace passively that was set out before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him? Look, Christian, God didn't choose you because he saw that you would be holy and blameless. God chose you so that he would make you, through Jesus, holy and blameless before him. Ultimately, through the work of Christ being in your place, so that his life without sin covers yours, so that his death on the cross for sin is in the place of yours, so that his resurrection from death to life will be yours. He has chosen you to make you holy and blameless. The first reason we receive God's grace is by being chosen before the foundation of the world. Now, Paul surely gets into something that we do, right? Second reason, the second way that we receive God's grace is by being predestined for adoption. No, nothing we do again. We're passive again, aren't we? Both of those words, I mean, these go together. He predestined, read it, in love, at the end of verse 4 and the beginning of 5, In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Both the words predestined, you get that predestiny, a predetermining of where your destination would be, and adoption, both don't have anything to do with you and what you do and what I do. We may think of adoption, and you may not get there as quickly in your mind. You hear predestination, you're like, okay, that doesn't, that's God. Adoption, and it may be fuzzier, but if you just think about it, adoption has nothing to do with the kid. It's the parent who adopts. The kid doesn't really have as much of a say. It's just they are adopted. They are brought into a good family. They're a lot of times in a bad family, and a family who wants to love them and take care of them says, come here. And the kid's like, all right if things go smoothly. Adoption doesn't have anything to do with the one being adopted as much as the one who is adopting. And so he, before the foundation of the world, in love, he looked upon you and said, I've not only chose you, I've chosen you to bring you into my family, to adopt you, to give you the title of son, even women, because the point is not our gender here. The point is that the firstborn son in this culture had all of the inheritance rights of the father. And so when he says, even to you women, he says, you're an adopted son of God. Don't change that and say, well, I'm a daughter. When Paul says that, he means it because he's meaning we, because of Jesus, get all of the inheritance. We're not a, none of us are second-class children. 
Because of Jesus, we all have that sonship, meaning we are the heirs. We get everything that belongs to the Lord. He gives it all to us. Adoption is a legal procedure that secures a child's identity in a new family. So he's saying, I predestined you to adopt you. I predetermined I was going to adopt you. So to grab this, imagine you are an orphan at an orphanage. And you're told that there is a very wealthy, well-to-do man that is on his way, and he's thinking about adopting you. And so everyone at the orphanage would likely be telling you, okay, do this, don't do this, make sure that you take a bath and you're cleaned up and you say, yes, sir. And you know, they're telling you how to act to make sure that things go how they should so that the guy will adopt you. And when he gets there, you blow it. You went out and you played outside. You got dirty. You didn't say yes, sir. You started crying. You wet your pants. Like oh, Everything that could go wrong, you're just like, ah, it's not going to happen. And then the guy just looks at you and says, let's go home. And if you were to ask him on the way home why, what he would say is, I don't care what anyone at the orphanage told you. I decided I was going to adopt you before I left the house. Nothing's going to change that. Friends, if you're in Christ, if your faith is in Jesus, that's how you know. Election is unconditional, but salvation is not. It's based on the condition of faith, but the only way you end up exercising that faith in Jesus is because He says, I've chose you before the foundation of the world. I'll make you holy and blameless before me. I've predestined you in love for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. If you're in Christ, know that before the world existed, the Father looked at you and said, I'm coming to get you. That's why Martin Luther called Jesus the hound of heaven. He said, he will sniff you out. He will find you. He will track you down. If he's aimed on saving you, you're as good as saved. What we find in the Protestant Reformation is that these reformers, as one author put it, he said what they discovered in the cellars of 16th century medievalism is 200 proof grace. It's all grace. It started before the foundation of the world. Anyone that will be saved, ultimately you trace it back, and it's because God set his love on them long ago. That's the second way that we are receiving grace by being predestined for adoption. Have you ever feared that you would somehow lose your salvation? Like you know you're you're in a right standing, but you just fear, like, on the last day, I don't know. Or I could do enough to lose it, whatever it may be. Have you ever thought about that at all? What you need to hear is that the gospel says you are as secure as you can be because in the final analysis, your salvation didn't have anything to do with you. If you zoom out far enough, you see that it was God saving me the whole time. And the gospel says you can be secure because God is not your foster parent that might lose you. He's your father. He says you're mine. You're never going anywhere. The point of Paul revealing this is not so that we get in Facebook debates about, well, I believe in election or I believe in predestination like this. The point is so that you and I as Christians would know even when we blow it. The Lord is saying this ultimately doesn't have anything to do with you and how good you can do. Before the world existed, I chose you. You're not going anywhere. I'm going to keep working on you. You're mine. You're in my family. I've adopted you. And if good parents in this life would never even dream of getting rid of their kids, how much greater is our Heavenly Father when He says, I don't care what you do. You're not going anywhere. You're my son. You're mine. This is why Christians love adoption. Because despite us being the orphan that d doesn't deserve to be taken home, the father looks at us and says, I decided to take you home before I left the house. You're mine. This is why we should all love adoption and we should all, to, to whatever ends, in whatever way we can, seek to adopt. As many of you have. 
and want to someday. It's a big deal. 40% of kids in the U.S. tonight will go to bed without a father in their life. A majority of children born to women 30 years and younger are born out of wedlock without a dad there. Some of you single men, you need to really consider looking at single moms, dating single moms. Don't overlook that. Don't be so trivial. Kids need dads. Kids need moms and dads. So let's adopt. Let's do everything we can. Out, out of this, I mean, look at this. If you get the gospel, you say, I love adoption. I want to help people adopt or I want to adopt. Let's make it happen. It's a need. Some of you had a bad dad who abused you, who abandoned you, or who was just not there. Some of you had families that were just kind of non-existent or left you wanting. What the gospel says to you is, you've got a good dad. You've got a father who has said, I'm never going anywhere. And what you need to hear of the, those of you who have families, it's just difficult. You need to hear that the church is your family. We're adopted into the same family. That's why we call one another family. We are heirs, brothers and sisters in Christ. That's not just something we say because it's like, you're my brother and sister. It's biblical, theological truth. We're adopted into the same family. You've got a father in Christ. You've got a family in Christ. Oh, please don't neglect him. Don't neglect your family. That's the second way we receive grace. And the third, surely he gets to us doing something. No. The third, we receive grace according to the purpose of his will. Look at the second half of verse 5. According to the purpose of his will. Why? That, that's what you got to do. Because this is totally counterintuitive to everything. We think you got to do something. You got at least, like, God goes 99.999% of the way, and we got to take that 0.0001 step, and, you know, he just says, nope, it's all of grace. Why? Why is it to, according to the purpose of his will? Well, Paul tells us, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. That's in Christ. Why does God choose us? Why has God predestined Christians for adoption as sons according to the purpose of his will? So that he would be praised to the praise of his glorious grace. Now, I can't get ahead of myself too much because that's soli deo gloria, to the glory of God alone, which we'll be back in Ephesians 1 for. If you liken the gospel to a body of water, this passage is where you can see down the deepest. This is where God gives us a God view, a sovereign view of how anyone is ever saved. This is the way zoomed out. You're in Christ. You put your faith in Jesus. You were born again because I chose you before the foundation of the world. According to my purpose. And if you liken it to a glorious skyscraper, the gospel is this beautiful building. These verses are the foundation which make the skyscraper possible. Every promise to a Christian in the New Testament is ultimately at its deepest level rooted in this. When God says in Romans 8, 28, probably one of the most quoted verses in the New Testament, what is it? All things work together for good. For those who love God and are called according to His purpose. You've heard that, right? All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Why? How does Paul explain it? Why do all things work together for good? Well, verse 29, right after that, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined. And those whom He predestined, predestined He also called. Those whom He called, He also justified. Those whom He justified, He also glorified. 
why, for Christians, will all things work together for good? Because God chose you before the foundation of the world. How can Paul give comfort to the Romans? He says, guys, the, he's, he's working everything sovereignly for his glory and for your good. If you're in Christ, chill out. He chose you. If he predestined you, he's going to call you. If he calls you, he's going to justify you. If he justifies you, he's going to glorify you. All of the great promises we have in the gospel find at its bedrock. You're not going anywhere. I've got you forever. Do you see why the reformers were so insistent that we're not just saved by grace? We're saved by grace alone? Do you see why this matters for us now? Do you see why this matters for your life? You're going to blow it a lot over the course of your life. And this is where you should go. Sin is such a big deal, Jesus died for it. You want to repent. Yeah, that's what the Holy Spirit is going to do in your heart as you sin, as you battle, as you struggle. He's going to convict you and bring you back and point you where you should go and where you need to go to get your mind and heart out of the gutter, wallowing in your self-guilt, is to go right to Ephesians 1. Go to Romans 8, go to Romans 9, go to John 6, go to John 10, where it's so clear that the Lord is saying, you can relax. Sin's a big deal, and you need to repent. And I'm never going to leave you. I chose you. You're mine. The Reformers were, when they discovered this, they just were lit on fire with passion. There was a guy named Ulrich Zwingli, who was a pastor, theologian in Zurich, Switzerland. And to this day, there's still in Zurich a statue of him, and he's holding a sword, and he's holding a Bible. He's holding a sword because he actually died on a battlefield when he was being the chaplain. He was killed in about 1530. But before that, he was in a place called Basel, Germany, and he was there with that guy named Erasmus, who first started printing the Greek New Testament as he put it together, the original language of the New Testament. So Zwingli was there, and he got Erasmus's compilation of this Greek New Testament and started reading it and loving it and realizing the gospel as he read the Bible. And so he loved it so much that he started hand-copying all of the letters of Paul in the New Testament. So he, in Greek, hand-copied all every letter that Paul wrote in the New Testament just so he could memorize it and he could write it out and have his own copy. And he started to do the gospel accounts as well when he applied for a job in Zurich, Switzerland, and he moved there and he became the pastor on January 1st, 1519. A little bit after the Reformation really kind of started with Luther, but it was still in the early years. He started preaching as we do today, as the Catholic Church didn't back then, he just started, as they gathered for worship, he would open the Bible and he started preaching through the Gospel of Matthew. He started with Matthew 1, 1, straight from the Greek. And what he discovered as he studied through the New Testament, one of the topical sermons he gave was basically on the condition of what foods we can eat because the Roman Catholic Church, in order to receive some graces, had Lent established, and Lent is still established today by Rome. And there are certain days in Lent that you don't eat at all, and there was a Friday, and because he had been reading the Bible, he had said to his church, I don't see Lent in here. We don't receive the grace of God through Lent and through abstaining from eating certain foods certain days, and so they had a big sausage supper in Zurich on a Friday during Lent to say, we can eat what we want. We don't receive grace through Lent. We receive grace through Jesus. Look up Zwingli. He's awesome. He's kind of crazy, but when these guys start rediscovering the gospel, they go nuts. He started reading through and seeing, hey, pastors can too get married. Because priests weren't allowed to marry for hundreds of years in the Roman Catholic Church. He says, they can too. So they started getting married. Martin Luther was the first of the reformers who got married. Then he saw stained glass windows aren't in here, and we don't receive grace through the saints who are depicted in these stained glass windows. Get them out. So they destroyed all the stained glass windows in the church building, where we would look and go, well, if there were saints in there, yeah. But, you know... 
stained glass windows, those are expensive and beautiful. Get them out. He kept reading. He said, organs aren't in the New Testament. He took an ax and chopped the organ to pieces in the church building that he pastored. We would we go, oh no, like those great grand 16th century organs that fill it all up. He said, uh-uh. We're going back to what this says. And he went a little too far some areas. I mean, you don't have to take an ax to a, an organ, but you see how for hundreds of years the gospel was lost. We're saved by grace as you get them through your works. And they discovered this and said, the Bible matters alone. We don't get grace through Lent. We don't get grace through Mary. We don't get grace through the Pope or ultimately through the church. We get grace according to God's sovereign disposition, according to God dispensing it on us and as you notice, as we read through Ephesians 1, he just keeps saying, in Christ, in Him, in the Beloved. Grace is free for us. And we only get it because it was infinitely costly for Jesus. Grace is totally free because it cost Jesus everything. That's exactly where Paul goes. Look at verse 7. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. What does that mean? It means through Jesus being killed in our place. Through His blood being spilled out before His life's natural end, not just through Him dying of old age, but by Him being killed in our place in Him. We have this redemption. We get all these blessings ultimately, as Paul keeps saying, in Christ, in the Beloved, in Him, because this Him, Jesus, went to the cross, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. God chose, the Son accomplishes our salvation, and the Spirit in time applies it to us and opens our eyes to the gospel, and we trust Jesus. The Bible doesn't teach that we have a quantitative problem when it comes to our sin, that we have sins, we need graces. It's much worse than that. The Bible teaches that one act of disobedience makes you a transgressor of the entire law. If you disobey one, you've not upheld any of it. Our problem is much worse than, oh man, I got some sins stacking up. Our problem is sin, that we are sinners. And on the cross, Jesus was made sin for us. Jesus was treated as one who was unholy. Jesus was blamed so that we in Christ could be holy and blameless before him. On the cross, Jesus paid everything so that we could have everything in Him. Jesus was treated like a sinner so that you and I, who've been predestined, could actually, justly, rightly be adopted as sons. Jesus gave up His sonship on the cross and was treated like we deserve so that we could be treated like He deserves. Everything the Father chose, Jesus actually makes possible and accomplishes it so that God can be just not just overlook our sin, but it can also look at you and say, what I've chosen forever ago, I'm making a reality right now because of what Jesus has done for you. I'll end with what Ulrich Zwingli says. He says, our confidence in Christ does not make us lazy, negligent, or careless. But on the contrary, our confidence in Christ awakens us urges us on and makes us active in living righteous lives and doing good, there is no self-confidence to compare to this. What Zwingli got is what we need to get. The grace of God is not a license to sin. The grace of God given to us freely at great cost to Jesus is the one supreme motivation to obey, to tell other people the good news. So how do you know if you've received the grace of God? Your faith is in Jesus. That's how you know.
Charles Spurgeon said, if God said that every one of the elect had a yellow line painted on his back, I'd just run around to everyone and pull the shirts up and look. He said, he hasn't told us that. He said, I will know the Lord's elect by preaching the gospel and they will come to Jesus through faith. As far as we know, it's everyone we've ever seen. This is a supreme confidence builder in your life and also this will build confidence in telling people the gospel because in the end God says, I'm going to save my people. Go tell them the gospel and watch. Go beg them to come to Jesus and watch as I bring them in and as they walk through that threshold through faith in Jesus, they see whosoever will may come, just as we all did. And we come through that door, through faith in Jesus, through confidence in Him. And then when you turn around after coming through, you'll see on the back side of that door, chosen before the foundation of the world. Offer Jesus to people and know God is going to save His people. Rest in Him. And may your life be lived just under the banner. May you frequently remind yourself, sola gratia. We are saved by grace alone. Pray with me. Father God, thank you so much that salvation is by grace alone and not according to our works. Because if it depended on me at all, I would blow it. Father, I confess, if I could lose my salvation, I would. I ask you to open all of our eyes wider and wider and wider to the good news of the gospel. I ask you to give people eyes to see the truth and to put their confidence in Jesus alone. Come to him through faith and know that if they do, they were chosen before the world began. Give us rest in the gospel knowing that there is nothing we can do to separate ourselves or be separated from your love in Christ Jesus. Help us to appropriate the truth of your word and to live lives in response to it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.